Raise your hand if you have a, a smart watch, Apple Watch, any kind of version of that. Yeah, a lot of you do. So I got one not that long ago. Um, I wasn't sure they were going to stick around, but apparently they are. No, I'm just kidding. I, I, several of you have those. I, I, have, a, I have a Garmin watch, um, and, and I always wanted one, but I never, did, I never could pull the trigger on one. I, I'd gone so long without it. I, I think like the first Apple Watch came out in 2013, 2014, something like that. And I'm sure there were some, some earlier versions. But uh, anyway, I, I just could never bring myself to get one. It's like, do I really need one? Do I really want one? I mean, all the cool kids have them. But do, do I really? I wasn't sure if I needed one. And, and for a while, I wasn't even wearing a regular watch. But, you know, I just, I, I, but a couple of months ago, I broke down and, and I got this one. And um, it's, it's, it's pretty cool. I, I get it mostly to track the exercise or, or to track all the exercise that I don't do. Um, and, and I can see t- I can see text messages on this on on my on uh, on this watch. Uh, I can't answer them. I can see who's calling me, uh, see who I'm going to ignore, and, and those kinds of things. But but it also it keeps track. I mean I don't know if you know this, but it keeps track of all kinds of of, of crazy things. It tells me uh, when I'm at my desk, it'll tell me, hey you, you you haven't moved in quite a while. You sorry piece of human. So you need to get up and do something. You know, you're, you're just, you're just, uh, you're just wasting your life away. The, the other day I was playing golf with, with my boys and, and it, it popped on a message and it said that, that you have, you've had a stressful period and it may be time for you to relax and recover. And I was like, wow, this thing knows I'm horrible at golf. This is wild. And one of the things it does is it, it, it tracks calories. Uh, and so this can be good and bad, uh, uh, calories that you've burned and, I guess maybe you knew this, but I, and, and maybe I learned this at some point in school. I, I don't remember, but did you know that you burn calories when you sleep? Did you know that? Okay, okay well, you guys are smarter than me, but, uh, and I guess it makes sense, right? Because your body is still doing stuff, right? It's, it's still trying to keep you alive. And, and I looked it up, and, and the average adult, okay, whatever average is, um, you burn about 50 calories an hour while you're sleeping. Now that varies. There's a lot of there's a lot of factors that go into to how much you burn, but most of the websites I went to said uh, uh, 50 was about right. And I got super excited because like, oh my goodness, I've got a new health plan. You know what? So if if I can if I can sleep till around noon or one every day, I'm burning like 700 calories. This is awesome. So, uh, but it, but you know, just the idea of burning calories while you're just laying there. You know, you, you slobber running down, you're snoring like a freight train, uh, and, but, but you're burning calories. And it's sort of this counterintuitive. Yes, you know, if you were running or if you were at the gym working out or doing some kind of crazy activity, it would make sense that you'd be burning calories, but not just, not just laying there on the couch napping. But you are. And so the way my mind works, I, I started thinking about other things, it, you know, just in this world that may seem counterintuitive. Excuse me. Things that, that sort of go against the way that, that we normally think uh, about stuff. Like one of the examples that, that I came up with was, you know, when we hit a global crisis, you know, one of the things that we do is, is we go and buy toilet paper, you know, and that, that seems really not, <laughs> why would we do that? You know, water, food, but no, we got to stock up on all the toilet paper because they're coming after our toilets. <laughs> I don't know. It's just, it's what we do. And, you know, and I started, th- I looked up and I thought clouds, Did you know, this clouds, those, these, these big f- uh, cotton balls in the sky. Did you know the clouds are actually heavy? They're heavy. They, they can weigh hundreds of thousands of pounds, depending on how much actual water is, is in them. And maybe everyone else in the world knew this, but you know, they just look so light and fluffy to me and they're just floating. I mean, you think something that weighs hundreds of thousands of pounds would fall to the earth, but they don't. An example, I was, I was looking at other stuff. Uh, I was watching uh, the, the, the newer version of Top Gun not that long ago. Uh, and if you've, uh, let me just, if any of you haven't seen that yet, he dies. And so I just want to tell you, <laughs> just kidding, he doesn't. He, he doesn't. He doesn't. But anyway, you know, when you land an airplane, right, the, 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 what seems intuitive is that when you come, you're, you're trying to slow down, slow down, and then you want to just land and hit the brakes, because that's what they do in commercial airlines, right? You're slowing down, you're slowing down, you hit, you hit, you land, the pilot, you know, pulls on the brakes and, and reverse thrust, all this kind of stuff. But in naval aviation, according to Maverick and Goose, what you have to do is, as you're coming down, when you hit the runway, you hit full throttle, and you burn to try to go as fast as you can, because that hook... There's a hook on the end of the plane, and they've got cables, and they're trying to catch it. But if that cable doesn't catch, if the hook doesn't catch the cable, guess what they got to do? They got to take off. And so, if they don't have full throttle, they aren't going full speed. Then they'll then they'll crash 
uh, into the ocean. I, it just doesn't, you know, that just doesn't really make sense. It's like you should be slowing down. But no, you're, you're actually speeding up. Here's one from my own life. It's almost as exciting as naval aviation. It's the first time when I learned how to snow ski back in my 20s. Um, I didn't grow up skiing. It just wasn't a thing that, that our family did. Um, but, but one of the things that I, I took a, a lesson, a half-day lesson, which looks like that was plenty. No, it wasn't. But I took a half-day lesson, and, and, and the instructor told me, hey, Jimmy, if you'll pick up speed, the faster you go, the easier, the easier it will be to turn, to make a turn. And if you're snow skiers, you know this to be true. But for me, you know, he was saying, you know, faster, get up speed, get up speed. And in my head, I'm like, no, 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 slow and in control, slow and steady, you know, make the pie and just stay there. Meanwhile, you know, five-year-olds are skiing around me, just checking on me, make sure I'm okay. I, I look like something, something's happened to me. But, you know, just, it's this I, idea of, of counterintuitiveness, right? It's just, it's sort of this, the definition is it, it's contrary to our intuition or, or common sense. And I know some of you are thinking, okay, Jimmy, where are you going with this? And I'm glad you asked. And so if you have a Bible, I'd love for you, if you haven't already, to turn to Luke and go to Luke chapter 9. We're going to be looking at three verses and really focusing on, 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 the, on one. So we're in, the, we're in the middle of the series. Actually, we just started it. Previn started this series last week. Uh, and it's a series, it's called Called. Uh, and, and the idea behind the series is that faith in Jesus isn't just about kind of what we believe, right? We, there are things that we have to believe, convictions that we have for sure, but it's, it's also more. It's, it's about who we are as, as an individual. It, it's about how we think. It's about what we do. This being called gives us a, a purpose. It gives us identity. And, 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 and so when we're called, it's not just to say, hey, I believe in Jesus, but that belief then changes who I am, and it affects how I live, and it affects how I do life, and it affects how I think about life, not only about myself, but I think about our world, and I think about the people around me. And to be real honest with you, being called, living as a follower of Jesus, is, is, it's going to be counterintuitive to the world's thinking. And, and if I want to go just a little bit further, and if we're honest with ourselves, it's counterintuitive to how a lot of us as believers, how we think and how we approach life. Case in point, our scripture for today, Luke chapter 9, uh, starting in verse 23, and it says this, and this is Jesus talking. It says, then he said to them all, if anyone wants to follow after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life because of me will save it. For what does it benefit someone if he gains the whole world and yet loses or forfeits himself? You know, those, the, those verses, and especially verse 23, I, I can kind of sum it up with, with one word, and it's this word. It's surrender. It's surrender. As a follower of Jesus, we are called to surrender our lives to the will, to the lordship, to the leadership of Jesus Christ. And not just as followers of Christ. That's the call that he has for anyone who wants to follow him. And that's not how we intuitively live life, right? We, we, we aren't big fans of, of giving up control over our lives. We, we're not banging the drum of self-denial, you know, deny self. We're not campaigning for our lives to be ruled by, by, by someone else. No, we, we actually, we want to be in control. We, we want to have a say in the matter. We want to live our lives the way that we see fit. And we, you know, we say things like, ain't nobody going to tell me what to do. This is my life. This is my house. This is my money. This is, you know, whatever. You just go on and on. And we champion self-control, and we can't champion self-reliance or self-preservation or self-importance or, or self-protection. But if you read this passage, Jesus speaks directly against all of that. In fact, he uses a pretty, a pretty difficult idea to communicate what requiring, what, what's required of those who follow him. He says this phrase, take up your cross. Now, in other words, you have to die. We have to be careful when we read Scripture like this that, that we don't read it as Americans living in 2024. Um, we have to read and put ourselves in the position and the mindset of how the original audience heard this. And nothing about take up your cross was good. Nothing about that was a positive idea or even remotely inviting. You know, the cross for these people meant meant death. It was the death penalty. It was, it was a method of torture, a method of, of humiliation, of, of, of execution. 
And it wasn't a piece of jewelry that they wore, uh, or it wasn't something that they used as a decoration in their homes. The cross, for these people, meant death. And for Jesus to say this would have been so opposite of what they would be thinking about following this guy and what this, this would mean. And here's what's crazy about this passage is Jesus, he lets everyone know on the front end of things that this is what it means to be his follower. It's not something that the really dedicated followers of Jesus do. You know, it's not just something for, for, you know, for those radical, radical Christ followers. No. Verse 23 says, if anyone, anyone wants to follow after me, He's not talking uh, just strictly to his disciples. He's not even talking strictly just to his 12. He's saying, he's addressing this to everyone, and this is what is expected. Here's, <laughs> this is expected of everyone from the outset. So Jesus is saying, when you say yes to me, you're saying yes to this. This doesn't come in year five of being a Christian, or, or you don't get this when you hit age 60 and above, or anything like that. No, this isn't something that only a few are called to. This is actually the basics of what it means to be a follower. Now, you look at the context of this passage, and, and Jesus, he, he, look at verse 22. He says this in, in chapter 9. He says, it is necessary that the Son of Man, that he's, that's how he talks about himself, he refers to himself, it is necessary that the Son of Man suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, be killed, and be raised the third day. And Jesus was telling everyone that was in earshot, this is what I'm I'm headed towards, and this is what you can expect. You have to die. Now, I, I, I don't know about you, but I'm trying everything in my power not to die. I mean, dying just seems really (laughs) extremely counterintuitive to what I want to do and my goal for this day and the next few days and months and years, right? I I, I don't want to, so consequently, I kind of live my life uh, using all my power to avoid that. I don't don't think I'm alone in this. Um, Dying was not on my agenda this morning. Now, I I will say this, following Jesus doesn't necessarily mean for for you and I that, that that it will result in physical death. But many of just Jesus' disciples, many of these hearers, his apostles, many Christians throughout history, and many Christians today are literally dying. They're experiencing martyrdom for being Christ's followers. And, and for most of us right now, we're, we're blessed at this point in our history that this is, this is not an imminent, uh, imminent, sorry, imminent reality for us. But the call is still the same. The call is to die, to surrender. And so the question for you and, and for me is, is how, do, how do we do this? How do we surrender? Well, we find the answer right there in, in verse 23, and it starts with, with this first thing. Number one is that you have to deny yourself. That Greek word there, to deny, it can simply mean this idea of denying the truth of a statement, but it it's almost always has overtones of, of association or connection to a person. Uh, One commentary I read said, denial in the New Testament is the intentional disassociation from relationship with uh, a particular person. Uh, Another way of of maybe another word or words you could use or to be to to say, I want to disown or I renounce. Like, for example, uh, this is the same verb that Peter uses when he denies Jesus. He denies that he knows Jesus or has any association with him. So, so self-denial then is the intentional disowning of the self or stepping away from a relationship with self is primary. You're denying this so-called truth that we are somehow in charge. That we are Lord over ourselves. That we are God. Now, Jesus, be clear, Jesus is not making a statement about whether the self is bad. He's not looking at you and saying you're bad. He's not saying that, but about how, about who we are most closely associated with. Who is our, who is our primary allegiance to? Is it to Him? Or is it to ourselves? And, and the way that this word, this verb is, is translated in the Greek, it, it's, it gives this idea that, that Jesus is saying, you need to do this now. Like, don't delay. Stop living for yourself. Deny yourself. Titus, Chapter 2, verses 11 and 12 says, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, instructing us to what? To deny godlessness and worldly lust and to live in a sensible, righteous, 
and godly way in the present age. The Apostle Paul there says, he's basically saying, listen, you've been given the gift of salvation that has been offered to you through the amazing grace of Jesus. And now that means we are called, that means we're called to stop chasing after or to deny or to dissociate or to disown the desires in us that keep, keep living like we have always lived before we found Christ. We're called to live for him. That's, that's our identity as, as, as people who are called to follow Christ. We, we've disowned our life. We, we've, we've relinquished this right to say, you know what, I'm, I'm number one. When it comes to Jimmy's life, Jimmy, he's number one. We're not in control. Denying self, it, it's, it's sort of this lifestyle. It's, it, it's who we are. And, and I love this quote that I found. It says, if we don't deny ourselves, then we will deny Jesus. If we don't deny ourselves, then we'll deny Jesus. Surrender, it means letting go. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, it says, I have been crucified with Christ. And look at that phrase there. And I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. That verse speaks to death. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. But that, my friends, is very counterintuitive. Everything in us screams this. I want to be in control. I am the boss. I call the shots. And by the way, that's how the, the, the world sort of operates too. The world that, that, that is apart from Christ. This is how they live their lives. And Jesus knows this, and that's why He says what He says next. It's the second part of surrender. It's deny yourself and then take up your cross daily. Crucifixion was reserved specifically for offenders who had rebelled against the authority. To, to take up one's cross, it, it referred to this practice that the Romans did to, uh, of forcing this condemned person who was, who was being executed to carry the cross beam to the actual execution site. And what this, this was, what was meant to illustrate was is that, you know, yes, you rebelled against this authority, but now you are completely conquered and your last act in life is going to be to carry the instrument of your demise in, 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 to the place of your death. It was a show of like complete and un, uh, utter submission. You tried to rebel, but now you, you are submitted to the authority that you were rebelling against. And so a call to take up one's cross as a part of following Jesus is, is the call to, to ultimate submission to Christ and His will for our lives. What it boils down to is is this issue of authority. Do you submit to the authority of Christ in your life? Or do you simply live with this idea that, you know what, Jesus, you have a lot of good ideas. And I like a lot of them. And I'm going to take them under advisement. Or maybe you're even a little bit more brazen than that, and you just say, you know what, I ain't going to do anything you say. Because I don't trust you. I don't trust your authority. I don't believe that you have what's best for me. Here's the thing, though. We're, we're always sort of looking for an easier way, uh, a, a quicker way, a, maybe a more efficient way of doing things, problem solving, trying to figure out things in life. I mean, it's, it's, it's what we do. It's, it's what we all do. Because it just makes sense, right? If, if it's easier, let's kind of do it that way. Or if it's quicker, let's definitely, let's, let's, let's do it that way. If it saves money, well, hey, we're all about saving money. Let's, let's do it. If it's more efficient, let's do it. We live in that world. I live in that world. Um, I, I told you about trying to track my workouts, and I go to the gym about once every third, uh, every other third Thursday of the month. And, and so when I go there, there's this place where I work out, there's always, there's always a trainer there. Um, and it feels like, and I know that this, is, this probably says more about me than the actual trainer, but it feels like that he is, he is watching me. And I assume he's watching me because of how awesome I am. But I think mostly he's watching me for my own safety and protection and just amazed at what I'm doing or not doing. But one of the things that, that he told me after watching me, he, 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 you know, he was, I, was, I forgot what I was doing, uh, but, but he was correcting my form. And he said what, what happens is, is once you start to get tired or you start to get weary, your body tries to cheat. And it tries to, to, to make whatever you're doing easier. 
It tries to, to make it, you know, in trying to accomplish uh, the goal. And, and, and I started thinking about that, and the same thing happens in our spiritual lives. We look for maybe what would be a, a safer, uh, an easier, a, a less uncomfortable way of doing life following Jesus. The, the, the British theologian John Stott, he said it this way, we want our Christian, uh, I'm sorry, we want our Christianity to be respectable, but we don't want it to be uncomfortable. We want it to be respectable. We want everyone to look, feel like, hey, that, that's a you're, a, you're a good Christian. But we sure don't want it to look uncomfortable. We're okay with certain things of God, but you know, let's not, let's not get crazy here, Jimmy. We want to treat a relationship with Christ like we do when we order a hamburger, right? I want this, I want this, I want this, but cut that, cut that, and cut that, right? Burger King, have it your way. And that's what we want. But that's not submission to God's authority. That's not being a, 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 a disciple. Um, that's not giving a, you know, getting rid of this inclination to, to change our ways uh, of thinking about how we're in charge. That, that's, we need to understand that we need a Savior who loves us, who will lead us, who wants us to be more like Him because if left to ourselves, we're going we're gonna to do what we want to do and what we want to do doesn't always line up with what God wants us to do. You see, the opposite of cross-bearing is is uh, self-preservation. And too many of us are more interested in that than we are in doing the will of God. And oh, by the way, did you catch the, 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 the important word that comes right after take up your cross? It says take up your cross what? Luke says this. Daily. Daily. Being a follower of Jesus is not seasonal. As a matter of fact, it's not even just something that we do on Sundays. Being a follower of Jesus is, is every day. It's, it's, it's who, again, who we are. We, we're called to surrender, and that means surrender is, is a part of what we do. It, it's, our, it's our identity. You see, nobody really chooses to lose. Nobody wants to be the loser. But that's, that's exactly what Jesus is calling us to do. He's saying, hey, listen, lose the idea that you're in charge and take up your cross daily because guess what? Tomorrow, you may not feel like it, so you're going to have to choose again to follow me. Uh, later on today, as a matter of fact, some of you may want to kind of crawl, creep back up and crawl on the throne of your life and, and call, the, call the shots. But here's the thing, when, when we do that, what we're doing is our, our thinking is really short-sighted. Because we, we're sort of just focusing on here and now. And, 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 but if, if you remember what, what the cross did, it accomplished an eternal purpose. It was bigger than just what Jesus was doing in that moment. It, was, it mattered for all people, for all eternity. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2 says, Therefore, since we also have such a large cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every hindrance in the sin that so easily ensnares us. And let us run with endurance the race that lies before us, keeping our eyes, this is good, keeping our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before Him... He endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. She, did, did Jesus want to suffer on that cross? Well, His prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane let us know it really wasn't His first choice. But what Jesus understood was submission to the authority of His Father and that His death would accomplish a greater purpose. You see, we sometimes live too much in the here and now. We're too focused on, on our circumstances that we take up our, that we think to take up our cross, well, that's going to be a disaster because we need to be in control. But taking up our cross daily impacts today, but it also has an eternal impact. Taking up our cross daily means we are living for the purposes and plans of God under His authority and submissive to His will. It's counterintuitive to say no to self. But that's what Jesus is calling us to do. And He's calling us to do it daily because He knows our propensity to want to get back in charge. Surrendering is denying yourself, taking up your cross daily. And here's the third part of surrender that Jesus says. He says, follow me. Follow me. And when He says follow me, He's not simply just saying, hey, get behind me like I'm first in the lunch line. You know, it's not that. What He's talking about, He's talking about transformation. You see, following Jesus means to align our lives with His teachings and His examples, to embrace His values as our own. It signifies a willingness to leave behind old ways and old habits and to live out a commitment to Him above all other influences. 
In a word, it means surrender. You can't follow if you're always up front. Jesus never said in here, never said, you know what, I'll follow you. You take the lead. I'll go where you go. I'll surrender to you. When Jesus said this to his disciples, it changed, it changed literally what they did. They left what they were doing to follow him, it changed their identity, it changed opinions, it changed their priorities, it changed their understanding of, of who God was. Following Jesus is about doing the things that, that he would have you do, having values that, that he would have you have. It's about daily making the choice to live in a way that honors Him, impacts the world positively, and brings us into a deeper relationship with God. And imagine what would happen is if the few hundred of us in here today, if we walked out of here and we left this place surrendered to God, how would your work be different? How would your community be different? How would your home be different? How would your school be different? How would your marriage be different? How would you be different? Galatians 5.16 says, What I say is this, let the Spirit direct your lives and you will not satisfy the desires of the human nature. That word let is a big word because again, it's a choice. It's a choice. Paul reminded the church in Galatia, he said that in order to not live your life like you're in charge, you have to surrender to the Spirit's leadership in your life. You won't deny yourself if you don't follow Jesus. In other words, you can't do B, which is, which is to, to not satisfy the desires of your human nature. You can't do B, B if you're not willing to do A first. Why? Because B is intuitive. It's what we want to do. We want to take care of ourselves. We want to satisfy the desires of our own hearts. It makes sense. This whole thing of Jesus makes no sense. It's counterintuitive. But here's the funny thing. Jesus doubles down on this. Luke 9.24, we read it. It says, for whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life because of me will save it. So if I do what comes naturally, I'm doomed. But if I live counterintuitive, I will save my life. Jesus would say, yes. And here's the good news. The more that you deny yourself, take up your cross daily and follow Him, the more and more it becomes not just something that you do, but it becomes who you are. It becomes how you begin to think about life, how you see life, how you see yourself, how you see your identity, how you see your purpose, how you see others, how you live, how you interact, the choices that you make. It's your identity, and it's exactly what we're called to do. We're called to surrender, and God will empower us through the Holy Spirit to do exactly what He's calling us to do. And the call is open to anyone, everyone. Come follow me. Why? Because we are. We are all sinners and we're in need of a Savior. We can't fix our own sin problem. And the more we try, the deeper we fall into sin. We need Jesus. We need a Savior. He came to this earth to be our, our Lord and Savior, to die on the cross for our sins, to pay the penalty and take the punishment for our rebellion against God. But He didn't stay dead. He rose three days later. He conquered sin, death, and the grave and making it possible for us to be in relationship. We should be separated, right? Our, our, our sin, the wages of sin is death. But through the gift of God, we have eternal life. Jesus made it so we could have a relationship with God the Father again. And all you have to do is say yes to Him. Yes to His salvation. Yes to His Lordship. We like the salvation part, but I know myself, sometimes I struggle with the Lordship, but it's what it means to be a follower. And when you surrender, just I, I know I'm a little bit over time, but here's what I, I want to say three more things to you real fast. First, when you surrender, you're following Jesus. It's, it's about being unidirectional. It's like I, I'm fixing my eyes on Jesus. I'm, I'm not, as a follower of Christ, I'm not looking this way or this way. I'm not looking for other options. Think about being on a cross. Someone who's nailed to a cross, guess what? They're not looking around. They are just faced. In, in, I, I'm following Christ. I'm denying myself. Second thing is, is you're not going back. We sing the song, no turning back, no turning back. When you, when you follow Christ, when you surrender Christ, you're saying, listen, I, I'm not going back. What do you have to go back to anyway? We've already said we're going to deny ourselves. We've died to ourselves. So we're going forward. We're, we're looking at Christ. We're not turning back. And the third thing is, is that you have no further plans of your own. In other words, you say, God, I submit to your will. 
I submit to your authority. God, you are King of kings. You are Lord of lords. You love me. You died for me. You want to give me abundant life now and, and for eternity. And it all starts with that word. It all starts with surrender. Because it's about Him. It's what we were created for. Colossians 1.16 says, For through Him God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. Everything, everything was created through Him. And I want you to say those last two words with me. Ready, set, go. For Him. Say it again. For Him. You know what is one of the greatest things you could ever realize? A thing that will give you freedom and ease so much of, of burden off your life? It's when you realize this statement that it's not about you. It's not about you. It never was and it was never meant to be. We've been called to live our lives, or let me say it this way, we've been called to live the lives entrusted to us in surrender to God. We're not in charge and that's a good thing because God is greater and can accomplish more than we could ever think of, we could ever dream of, we could ever imagine. And so this counterintuitive idea of if you want to have life, then Jesus says, well, you have to give it up. And when you give it up, I'll give you true life if you follow me. Let's pray. Father, thank you for today. And I thank you for the opportunity to open up your word. And God, I thank you for the truth of your word. And God, I thank you that you call us to big things. You call us to great things. You call us to eternal things. And Father, I thank you that you don't, you're not trying to hide it. You're not trying to, to water it down, God, but you're just very clear that says that if we want to follow you, that we, we must deny ourselves, take up our cross daily and follow you. And Father, I pray that today we would do just that. God, whether that's saying yes to you for the very first time, or God, maybe it's recommitting ourselves to our yes. God, recommitting ourselves to denying ourselves to, to be willing to, to be uncomfortable for you, God, to, to take up our cross, and God, to be willing to let go of control and go where you want us to go and live how you want us to live. God, I know there's a lot of people in this room, and they're in a lot of different places spiritually, but I thank you that you meet us right where we are. And so, God, we come before you now, and what we say is we want to say yes. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.